This episode is brought to you by Kia's first three-row all-electric SUV, the Kia EV9, with available all-wheel drive and seating for up to seven adults, with zero to 60 speed that thrills you one minute and available lounge seats that unwind you the next. Visit kia.com slash EV9 to learn more. Ask your Kia dealer for availability. No system, no matter how advanced, can compensate for all driver error and or driving conditions. Always drive safely. A science story, huh? Is NYU a scientist? They I felt, felt I feel right. right. I was so and I just thought, well, I figured it, out. I it was that tall. golden moment. Because science was on my side. Hey everyone, I'm Ben Lilly, and welcome to the Story Collider, where we bring you true stories of how science has affected people's lives. This week's story is from Mara Wilson. The story was recorded in May 2013 at the Bell House in Brooklyn as part of our three-year anniversary. I think that many great romances don't start off immediately. I think there's a moment, and you see this a lot in art and in literature and in real life as well, where you look back and you realize that what you've been looking for has been there all along. I did not like science as a kid. I think this was partly because of my father's lectures. Uh, my father was, he is an electronics engineer and he'd been a pilot and he loved to tell me about lift and drag and aerodynamics and radio waves and when he told me that radio waves could go through almost anything, I said, could they go through me? And he said, yeah. And that felt kind of intrusive to me. I didn't like that. That felt very uncomfortable that there were these things all around me that could go through me. I was scared of everything as a kid. And I think when I got to school, I got this idea that uh, science was a natural world. So I didn't really like science because I was afraid of everything and the natural world was terrifying. Uh, this, was, this was never more clear than when, while, when I was in kindergarten and we had an assembly on astronomy. An astronomer came and he talked to us and in an attempt to make what he was doing uh, sound more exciting to kids, he started playing up the really scary, crazy parts of astronomy, but he ended up just making it terrifying. So I was sitting there, I was five years old, and he was going up there talking about Venus, which is this object in space where sulfuric acid rains down all the time, and the gases and the pressure can kill you, and it's 800 degrees, and I started to cry. <laughs> because that was scary, that there was this thing out there that could kill me in myriad ways. Even if I knew it wasn't actually a threat, it was still scary. And I cried even harder when he got onto solar flares because for some reason, I, I guess I thought, you know, when he was explaining that, you know, fire comes off from the sky, I was thinking the fire was going to rain down on the earth and kill us all. Uh, I was sort of suddenly face to face with my mortality and I was five. I, I like to call that my first existential crisis. Um, and I had to, I, I would not stop crying, and uh, the teacher had to pull me aside and calm me down. I remember her giving me a rice cake, uh, which for some reason calmed me down, and, uh, and my, my brothers made fun of me so much. They were like, hey, Mara, Venus is coming. Venus is coming for you, uh, for years afterwards, and my mom said, well, you know, maybe you were just getting something out of it that the other kids weren't, but I don't think I was. I, I, at least at the time, I did not think I was. Uh, it was just scary. So as I got older, I, I thought, I think I just kind of thought, well, I think I was very rebellious at that age. Uh, my mother died when I was eight, and I went from being really scared to being really angry. Maybe I was really angry because I was really scared. And there wasn't a lot of stability in my life, and I just felt angry and confused, and I needed to just lash out at anything, any kind of institution whatsoever. And I remember thinking that science was almost this institution of oppressive facts pushing down on me, and, and I didn't like it, I didn't want any part of it. And I thought science was not for the people like me, the creative people. Um, and also, I, I remember about this time, I had, uh, I remember there were, I heard about a study that had, had come out where they had been testing some kind of new cancer drug, and my mother had just died of cancer, and I thought, 
well, why couldn't they have come up with that two years ago? Why couldn't they have done that then? I didn't have any faith in any kind of medicine or science. Uh, and about this time, I read an article in uh, Highlights for Children by this, uh, some dude car called uh, Carl Sagan. And uh, I just, I, I had no idea who he was. I'd seen him in a Far Side cartoon once. But I, I started, I read it, and he was talking about the universe. And they asked him at the end of the interview, do you ever get tired of talking about this? And he said, no, because I'm in love with what I do. And when you're in love, you want to tell the world. Now, I don't even want the world to know that I had a crush on Jacob Hirsch the previous year, so I didn't see why he would want to tell the world about this. And also, why would he want to tell the world about something so boring like science? I mean, it wasn't like things that we creative people were into. You know, it was just rote memorization that I did so I could manage to squeeze out a B plus in that class. It wasn't anything interesting. But I do think after that, I started to have these little flirtations with science. Probably my first one was in sixth grade when we had to do an experiment. We could do any kind of experiment we wanted. And so I think I did something about uh, which shampoo cleans your hair better. It, it wasn't very, uh, the efficacy was very much in doubt. And the students, all the students formed groups and they had to go up and they'd present their hypothesis and then we'd put up the little posters that said, you know, what our conclusion was. And I noticed that the popular girls their, their hypothesis seemed different. And I remember going up to this one girl and saying, hey, Brittany, I thought you said your hypothesis was before that orange slice was going to shoot faster and, and create more foam than Coca-Cola. Why does it say now that you thought Coca-Cola was going to shoot the farthest? Why would you change it? And she went, oh, shh. And that didn't seem right to me. The fact that somebody was going to change their hypothesis that did, like to make it seem like they'd been right all the all the time, there didn't seem like there was anything wrong with being wrong, uh, which was a new feeling for me that there wasn't anything wrong with being wrong. But I thought, okay, who am I to defend science? And I just kind of went on with my life. Uh, then about a year later, I went outside and I looked up on our front porch, and there was a nest above the front porch light. And I got really excited because this was nature, but this was cute nature. And I went inside and I got my dad and I said, I said, Dad, Dad, look at that. Look at that. What kind of birds are they? My dad said, oh, I, uh, that's, that's neat. I think that they're sparrows. And I said, wow, sparrows. And about a week later, I realized that sparrows were the same boring brown birds that just hopped around our front yard. But for a minute there, there was real wonder and it was really exciting. And then I got to high school, and I was not very good in science classes in high school, and I was especially not good in physics, and that's my own fault. That's because uh, the first semester I had a really huge crush on Andrew Black, who sat next to me, and I spent all the time thinking about ways to get him to like me. And then second semester, uh, I was thinking about how much I hated Andrew Black because we'd gone out and he'd broken up with me and gone out with my best friend. And uh, so I spent a lot of time, you know, cursing, cursing him and uh, thinking about how much I hated him instead of actually focusing on uh, projectiles and such. And what I ended up doing at the end of the year was an assignment on, uh, we could do an assignment on basically any topic in physics. And I thought, okay, I'll salvage my grade and I'll do something that actually is kind of interesting to me. Uh, I'll do something on bubbles. And so I, I did. I, I looked up bubbles, and I looked up why we see color in bubbles. Now, this is something that my father had actually tried to teach me 10 years earlier, but had just made me go, uh-huh, 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 yeah, all right, I get it, yeah. And so this time I actually paid attention, and I actually went out and researched it. And I went up there, and I felt excited to be talking about bubbles, excited about bubbles, you know, for the first time since I was maybe five. And... From then on, every time I saw a bubble, I would think, I know your secret. I know how you work. There was an odd sort of communion there with me and bubbles. And, uh, and, and, and no, I didn't do drugs in high school. Um, and, and I think at the time, it also makes sense because I was going through some kind of spiritual journey at this time. I was 17 and I was at an art school in Southern California. So all of those things, spiritual journey, makes sense. And I was the star student in my comparative religions class. My, my teacher uh, told me that I had a true talent for theological thinking. And I was a little less angry and I was more into why <laughs> the things that made me angry, you know, why these things that, that made me angry and, and how and what. And I wanted to learn more and more about these things. And 
where I found I was finding a lot of my answers was actually in my biology class. I had this wonderful teacher, Jerry McCampbell, who unfortunately has since passed away. He had these big glasses, this big bushy beard. He'd gone to MIT. He was, you know, just very quintessential nerd, and, and I loved him. And we would talk in that class, and what I loved about it was that I could see that things were true, and I could see how they were true, but I could also see how we knew that they were true, the process behind it. It was like looking backstage during a production. And I really liked that class, and I would talk to him about things that I'd never wondered before, like, are humans going to keep evolving? And he would say, well, you know, we're changing the environment around us, so we're not really sure, you know, and we, we, can't, we can't really tell. I later learned that that was up, to, up for debate otherwise, but uh, that's a separate issue. And, um, and so I found myself getting more and more interested in what he had to say, and... I don't think, though that, though, that that was really the thing that made me fall in love. I think what it was, fitting for a theater nerd like me, was seeing a play uh, by Julia Sweeney called Letting Go of God, uh, which is about science and a religion. And uh, during the show, during the middle of the intermission, she tells people that they can come down and they can pick out books and just look through them, because these are all books that she's read. And I went down there and I saw a book that looked interesting, and it was by this guy, that same dude, Carl Sagan. And I picked it up off the shelf, and I read the back, and he was saying that he thought it was kind of sad that people couldn't really tell the difference between legitimate science and things like astrology and psychics and UFOs. And I thought, well, I believe in those things, don't I? Don't I? Actually, I don't really know what I believe in anymore. And... I started ruminating over that, and I thought about that constantly for the next few months. I graduated high school, and I went off to college, and once I actually got to college, I went to the library, and I checked out that book, and it was a book called The Demon Haunted World. And I brought it back to my dorm, and I sat down, and I started reading it. And I got to this quote in the second chapter where he says that... Uh, the very act of understanding is a celebration of joining, of merging, if even on a very modest scale, with the magnificence of the universe. And right then I knew I was in love. I felt like I was in love. I felt like I was seeing the world through different eyes. I felt like everything had suddenly changed in my mind and everything was suddenly so much more interesting and so much more alive and I felt like I was a part of it. I was alive in it. I was connected to it because what I'd learned from him and what I had finally put together was that science was not an institution. Science was not fact. Science was a method for discovery. And discovery was exciting. Discovery meant figuring out these, all of these exciting things around us. And it could also be very comforting in a way. It could be uh, figuring out, you know, why, why we, how we know that solar flares are not going to burn the earth to a crisp. It could be um, why, and, and it could actually help me understand things like why we are not going to have cancer drugs immediately, why these things take time, the actual history behind these things. And it was also finding the beautiful in the mundane, finding the color in bubbles and explaining why we found that color in bubbles and seeing the beauty and magnificence and intricate relationships in a nest of those boring brown birds that pop around the front yard. And probably science, probably the best thing about science though and the thing that I've never found in any relationship before or since is science admits when it's wrong. And that is something... And it's okay to be wrong, because that's not what matters. What matters is the actual discovery. What matters is learning about this. And another thing, too, is that it's not, it's not, <laughs> it's not just a two-way street. Science is, science is polyamorous, basically. Anybody can love science. Anybody can get in on science. Anybody can explore it. Any, anybody else can have the same kind of relationship with it. And I've realized that other people feel this way, too. And... I can talk to them about it and I can discuss it with them and they too will know that same discovery that comes when you look at a bubble or when you look at a bird. And uh, it's also, I think, it's probably something that's brought me closer to my father as well because now I can call him up and he will actually talk to me about radio waves and I will actually listen because I know how it makes him feel because I've felt that same feeling now. And 
I think that this is something that uh, I've been trying to communicate and I've been trying to explain. And it can be hard because I live in a community of people who think that, think very much the same way that I do, that they are creative, interesting people. They are, well, they are interesting people who think that they are creative people and that science doesn't mean anything to them. And I want them to know that it's not like that, <laughs> that they can enjoy science. And I want to keep telling that to people because I am in love, and when you're in love, you want to tell the world. Thank you. That was Mara Wilson. Mara is a recovering former child actor, best known for her roles in the films Matilda and Mrs. Doubtfire. These days, she writes plays, fiction, nonfiction, and regularly performs as a storyteller. She's a graduate of NYU Tisch School of the Arts Playwrights Horizons Theater School, but loves science far more than anyone with a BFA in drama really should. For more science stories, take a look at storycollider.org, where we have archives of the podcast and upcoming events. We have shows June 4th in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and June 18th in Manhattan. The Story Collider is produced by me, Brian Wecht, Aaron Barker, and Ari Daniel Shapiro. The podcast is produced by Rose Avalith. Additional help from Brooke Williams, Lena Groger, and Justin D'Ambrosio. The theme music is by Ghost. Special thanks to the Bell House for hosting the show and to everyone who came out to celebrate three years with us. Thanks for listening. What if you could have a career where the opportunities are as vast as our nation, where it's not about mission statements, but a shared mission? At U.S. Customs and Border Protection, we go beyond to protect more than borders. From ship to shore, air to ground, cities to local communities, CBP agents and officers are keeping people safe. Join U.S. Customs and Border Protection and go beyond for something far greater than yourself. Learn more at cbp.gov careers.